My name is Jeff Coleman, and I'm privileged to serve as the senior pastor here at Sugar Hill United Methodist Church, or as we affectionately call this place, the Church on the Hill. Welcome. We're glad that you're with us. Um, We also know this. I want to say welcome real quick uh, to those of you who are watching on Facebook Live. Good morning. We're glad that you're with us. Or maybe you're listening by way of podcast. We also know this. Most people are going to check you out online uh, before they're ever going to come. And so we want to say we look forward to meeting you soon. So... Welcome. Welcome to, to Sugar Hill. Um, also, when you came in this morning, uh, the, hopefully the ushers gave you a bulletin. Grab it for me, would you? Would you take that and then flip it over on the back side? Because there's a couple important spaces. One is there's a place to write down some ideas or some notes, and, and we're going to encourage you to do that because we think there's going to be some good stuff that's coming, and you're going to want to make some notes and jot some stuff down. And also at the very bottom of the page is the GPS, and that stands for Grow, Pray, and Study, and we're going to invite you to read the scriptures together, especially seeing as how we are kind of making a journey through the gospel of Mark. And so we are in Mark. Again, like I said earlier, we kind of waited uh, for the light of the world, and so then we celebrate the light of the world. And now he's here, and so we're gonna. Now we're asking the deeper question: Who is this man? Who is this guy? This man called Jesus? And so that's kind of where we are as we're in in the Gospel of Mark. And so if you have your Bible with you, and if you don't have a Bible and you want an easy to read translation, you can take ours. It's there. Hopefully, it's on a seat underneath, maybe the seat in front of you. You can take it, and it's a gift from us. Just go ahead and take it. It's not stealing. Uh, from the church if the pastor gives it to you so you can take the Bible with you. It's probably a good thing. And so we want you to be reading the Word. But, but turn with me, if you would, maybe on your phone. If you're carrying your Bible on your phone, you could turn your Bible on. How about that? And then go with me to Mark chapter 2 because that's where we're going to be this morning. And so as you're finding Mark chapter 2, I would simply tell you this. It started, uh, it, it occurred actually 104 years ago. 104 years, 6 months, and 15 days ago. Do you have any idea what that was? Like all the math people right now are kind of going, and then those of us who are like mathematically immune, you know, we're like, I don't know, those are numbers, you know. (laughs) And and so, but here it is. As you're thinking about it, I'll just go ahead and continue to, to fill in the gaps. 104 years, six months, 15 days, and the gentleman's name was Gavriello Princept. And and the truth is, not many people would remember his name. Uh, at the time, he was rather sort of an unknown individual. But some people suggest that everyone has felt the effects of this one young 19-year-old university student's decisions. Some scholars argue that this one man's decision shaped the 20th century perhaps more than any one single person. On June 28, 1914, this Serbian student... Gavriello Princep assassinated Archduke Ferdinand and Francis Ferdinand and his wife Sophia, which then in turn ignited World War I, which as a result of that brought about the, the Treaty of Versailles, which further plunged Germany into an economic depression, which sort of wrangled the feathers, if you will, of a rather plain Austrian corporal by the name of Adolf Hitler. He would slowly rise to power and obviously, as we all know, plunge the world into what was World War II. It was a war that divided Eastern Europe without regard to traditional borders or ethnicity or language or religion, which obviously now that we're embroiled in World War II hastened the research process and it brought about atomic weapons and the ensuing destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan, which had a direct impact uh, regarding the formation of the state of Israel, which then planted seeds of ethnic hostility throughout the region, which have grown into isolated wars and uprisings over the years since that period of time, and on and on and on and on it goes. And it's sad to think about, think about this, it's sad to think about the fact that one decision, one decision like Gabriel Princep, like one decision can have a lifetime of consequences. And what's equally sad is to think about is that we can go about doing a tremendous amount of good for others and for the community and for the Lord, and, and one bad decision can, be, can overshadow all that stuff, right? But here's the good news. Like, you know, you're sitting there and you're kind of going, well, this is kind of depressing, Pastor Jeff. Good start to the sermon, buddy. Well, no, here's the good news. Here's the good news. The good news is simply this. The good news is even though we're going to walk through life, we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to trip and stumble, and we've got our foibles, and we're going to bungle some things, The truth is God's going to use all of this somehow and God's going to shine through hopefully our acts of compassion and kindness and grace. 
I mean, think about this. Think about the one action by a woman by the name of Rosa Parks. You remember Rosa, right? She refused to give up her seat on the bus. One woman, one moment in time, one heroic act, and it helped change our nation for the better. In fact, when she was asked about it, she says this. She says, most people say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired, but that isn't true. I was not tired physically. No, the only tired I was was tired of giving in. It's sad, I think, sometimes to think that we could be remembered for one bad action, one wrong thing we did like Gavriello Precept. It's noble, however, to think that we could be remembered for the good things that we do and for the courage, for, for the times that we, 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 we take a risk, for the times that we upset the status quo or we're willing to take, a, to, take, take, take a bold step of faith even though everybody around us is going, don't do that or stop or what do you think you're doing? And sometimes we have to, we have to take that step. We have to be bold. Why? Because it's personal. Those decisions, decisions like that become personal for us for one reason or another, but especially when it's geared around doing the right thing that's on behalf of another person. This morning I want to share from you and I want to, I want to expound upon a story about four friends. Four friends and their names, their names may be similar to Gabriella Princep, the man who started World War I. He's not remembered and they weren't remembered either. But I want to invite you this morning to hear now a portion of the story of God from the book that we love. Mark chapter 2, the first 12 verses. Would you stand for the reading of the gospel? When Jesus returned to Capernaum, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no room even outside the door. While he was preaching the word of God to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the, paralyzed, to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and says, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we have never seen anything like this before. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Lord, in the time that we have remaining, we ask that you would speak to us and speak through me. And open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. In the name of Christ. Amen. So we move into Mark chapter 2. And Mark is going to set up a series of what we're going to call controversy stories. And so these are stories that, that pit Jesus sort of in conflict, if you will, with the religious leaders. And so there's this, this tension that's going to be happening throughout the Gospel of Mark. We only pick up just these 12 verses. But here's what I need to do is I'm going to unpack a little bit about this, these first few verses. I would say this, I need you to engage with your spiritual imagination. In other words, what I mean is I need you to, to be there. I need you to be in the room. I need you to be uh, on site and present and, and, and see it in your imagination. What does it look like? And so Jesus has been teaching. He's been traveling. And the text says that he has come back to, to Capernaum. As Capernaum is going to serve. It's there. It's at, the, it's at the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. And he's going to serve. That's going to serve as his, basic, his, his HQ, its headquarters. 
for his ministry operation. And so he's been traveling and going about, but he's back home and he's there and he's teaching. He's teaching in someone's home, presumably Peter. We don't know that for sure, but we think this may have very well been Peter's home, which is, again, like we talked last week, adjacent to the synagogue there. If you go with us in March to Israel, you're going to see all of this. You'll see the ruins of the house, uh, Peter's home, possibly where this actually may have, may have occurred. But nevertheless, they're, they're there. And so eventually there's four friends. There's four friends in town. Caper- Capernaum is not big. It's a very small area. It truly is. And so four friends are sitting around one day. So there's Ham, Sham, Frank, and Abimelech. And they're sitting around. And one of them looks and simply says, you know, I heard Jesus is back. And he says, yeah, I heard that too. He says, man, he's got like his following. And he's like, people are getting healed. He says, I know. This is epic. He says, you know who needs to be here? No, who? Larry. We should go get Larry. And the other guy goes, yeah. What if Larry don't want to go? Who cares? Right? And off they go. And they run across town. And they find Larry. And I just wonder, like, what happened when they come and they said, hey, Larry, have you heard about Jesus? He said, yeah, I heard about Jesus. He said, it's good. He said, man, he said, Jesus is back. He's teaching at the house. He said, we ought to go. He said, because he's there. And we're like, you know, maybe he'll, like, heal you. He's like, oh, God, fellas, I don't want to go. I mean, maybe he just didn't want to go out. Like, you ever have friends come up to you and say, hey, we're going out. You're like, no, it's not feeling it. What if Larry had said, no, nah, I'm not feeling it? And what if they, like, picked him up anyway? I mean, like, he's a paralyzed dude, right? I mean, like, you know, I mean, no offense. But, I mean, what if they just, like, four stretcher bearers, right? And they pick up the thing, and they're like, nope, here we go. And they're off, and they're running across town to go find Jesus. And off they go. And Jesus is there. He's in the house. And what's he doing? The text says, if you analyze it here, he's preaching the word to them. This is the core, if you will, of Jesus' ministry, is teaching the word. When suddenly... They get there, they look, you can see, it's crowded, we can't get in. You ever been there, like you're trying to get into a place and it's so crowded that like you just can't, and you're trying to squeeze through, and people are like, hey pal, stop, you know? And, and, and you know, like you're not getting through with a man on a mat. And then somebody had the bright idea, I was like, let's go up on the roof. Listen, imagine if you will, put yourself in the space, and Jesus is there, he's teaching in the, in the room, and suddenly you start to see dust start to fall, <laughs> Right? There's dust, and then there's a bit of a rock, and there's a few things, and whatever, and it just begins to happen. And it's just, it's, it's like happening. It's like right there. It's like real time. And here's what I'm thinking. As I'm in the story, I don't, I don't know if anybody didn't say, like nobody in the room went, it's okay, this is Mark chapter 2, you know? <laughs> like th- it's happening real time. Somebody would have said, hey, what are you doing? Like maybe the homeowner, you know? Because he's going, my house, my roof, dude, quit. But nevertheless, whatever is happening to the roof, and it's occurring real time right there, guess what? It's a showstopper. If somebody were on the roof right now with hammers and and jackhammers, and okay, our executive director, Wes Walker, is going to have a conniption fit. (laughs) Seriously. I mean, somebody's going to get tased or worse, you know? (laughs) Y'all know it's true. I'm just, I'm saying but it's a showstopper, and like everything grinds to a halt, and everybody goes, oh. And I just wonder, like, is this moment when they like tear open a hole in the roof, and maybe it was just big enough for somebody's face to like pop through, you know, and like look down into the room, and like, I wonder if this didn't happen. Four feet that way. <laughs> like, what if they dug wrong, you know? Like, they didn't line it up right. Have y'all thought about this? Is it just me? But you think about this, and so this is it, and so it stops, everything quits, it comes to a, it comes to a halt. And they lowered the dude. Like, what happens is they're lowering this man. Like, poor Larry. He's being lowered to the roof. He's going, Jesus, what am I idea? I said, no. I wanted to stay at the house. I was good to stay in tonight, man. I didn't want to go clubbing or anything like that. I was good. But here we are. Hey. You know? He's like, they're just lowering him in. And like, what happens if like one side goes too quick? You know, he's like, hey, hey, hey. You know? And then they finally lower him. And, and there he is. Now, here's the deal. They didn't wait. They didn't wait their turn. They broke line. They did. They did. Everybody else, has, everybody else has been waiting. The ministry of Jesus can be characterized as being Holy Spirit filled and Holy Spirit directed. Would you agree? Okay, let me say it again. The ministry of Jesus can be characterized as Holy Spirit filled and Holy Spirit directed. If you think that's true, say yes. yes. Okay, most of you. Not sure about this section over here, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll get to y'all later, you know. <laughs> so as a result, here's the thing. As a result, when the Holy Spirit shows up, Things get turned upside down. And like, you know, the status quo gets upset. And you'd think, right? Like you'd think people would be excited that God was moving and that God was doing amazing things and God was here and God was setting the world right. But that's really not what happens according to the text. 
J.D. Walt, who is an author, he says these words. When the Holy Spirit is at work, things get pretty messy, even out of hand. Unplanned and unpredictable stuff happens, and we have to see through all of that to the greater thing that God may be doing. So when God, listen, here I'm going to apply it to your life. When God begins to tear open a hole in the roof in your story, and dust begins to fall, and it's a showstopper, maybe what you need to do is not fuss and complain, but maybe what we need to do is begin to peel back and see the activity of God in the midst of it. You, you with me? Because God, chances are, he might, just might be up to something. He may be doing something. Unpredictable stuff. Like you just, like, this wasn't in the bulletin, y'all. <laughs> like, you know, somebody, you know somebody would have looked at the bulletin on that day and said, what's this hole in the roof part of the story, of the service? Like, that's not there. Because there's no bulletin. Now, here's where, it's, here's where it gets really interesting. Verses 5 and 7, 5 through 7. Seeing their faith. Like, Jesus, like those guys, they didn't lower themselves to the roof. Like, they didn't, like, rappel in, you know. Like, they're not there. They're still on the roof. Like, four faces peering in. And Jesus looks up and be like, you guys. Seeing their faith. Not the man's faith. Seeing their faith. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Pause, put a pen in it. I'm looking at Jesus. If I'm the man on the man, I'm like, Bro, that's not why I'm here. It's like, no, that's not why you think you're here. But that's why you're here. Sir, that's not why you think you're here today. That's why you're here. Hmm? Right? Like, that's it. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Now, notice, if you will, that the people who are upset in this moment are the religious leaders. And and also, notice, where are they located? They're inside, right? Like, they're inside the house. They're inside, and presumably, presumably, sitting close to the front, okay? So, the original language actually suggests that the room is so packed that people can't move, like it's a standing room only event. So, it's so packed that people who need to be inside and close to Jesus can't. Why? Because of all the insiders taking up space. So the insiders, stay with me, the insiders are hoarding, if you will, Jesus' teaching while those on the outside are powerless to reach him. So the obstacle becomes the house. How ironic that the very structure that is designed to provide Jesus rest and safety and solitude can sometimes become the very barrier that creates insiders in the first place and keeps outsiders out. Here's what that means to us. Sometimes the church is exactly what prevents people from coming, from outsiders coming into the inside. Sometimes the church is what prevents people from getting closest to Jesus. Like how many times have you ever talked to somebody about coming to church and somebody says it and they go, man, no, nah, it's okay, I don't, I, don't, I don't do church. No, I'm, I'm really kind of opposed to organized religion. I'm spiritual, but I'm just, you know, not like a religious thing. I don't have anything to wear. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't wear dress clothes. Just, no, I just don't do that. Or it's like, church? Mm, nope. If I wanted to feel guilty, I'd call mom. Thanks anyhow, you know, <laughs> right? Sorry, mom, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, you get this kind of pushback from people. But, you know what? As a result, desperate times require desperate measures. Thus, there's a hole in the roof. And so here's the thing. The religious leaders, actually, their objection is spot on. It's right. They're absolutely right. I mean, who can, who can forgive sins but God alone? And in fact, here's what they're asking. Who is this man? Or what they're really trying to say is, who does this guy think he is? And we'll talk about that later. So watch this. This is in verse 8 through 11. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? Now, I imagine Jesus saying that and pausing. And just like standing there and be like, So what's easier to say? You're forgiven, or get up and walk? And I wonder if anybody actually answered. Well, it's not recorded, but who knows, right? But I just imagine Jesus kind of engaging in this, in, in this conversation. And, and maybe there was this dialogue. Maybe Jesus paused and waited for an answer. I mean, because here's the thing. We all know it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because that's, that's internal. I mean, it's just easier to pronounce some, your sins are forgiven. We can say that. There's no, truth, there's no proof that it's true. It's harder to say, pick up your mat and walk, right? 
Like this is why some of us, when we pray for healing for people, we kind of hedge it, you know? You ever done that? You ever prayed for healing for somebody? And you kind of hedge it around that idea of like, well, if it's your will, you know? It's like, you're, it's like a safety clause or something, you know? It's like an escape hatch. Listen, here's what I think. Just go ahead and pray for healing and leave the results up to God. And just be bold, man. Just be bold. I'm praying boldly for some friends right now. I am praying so boldly for some friends. I, you know, I mean, I'm just, just, I'm just going to leave the results up to God. Why don't we just leave the results up to God and don't worry about it? We don't have to hedge bets or anything like that. Just, just. But, but here's what Jesus says. Watch this. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. <laughs> Boom. I just wonder if it happened like kind of quick. I, I wonder if he just went. You know, or was it like wobbly and was it shaky and did he struggle and somebody have to help him? We don't know. We weren't there. We'll have no idea until we get home. But here's the thing. He picked up his mat and he went home. Stunned onlookers. People are like, what the what? We've never seen anything like this. This is amazing, right? And no one bothered to write down that guy's name. <laughs> or his four friends. In fact, he's nameless. Fun fact, every miracle, every person who is a direct recipient of a miracle in the gospel of Mark is nameless, save one. Every person who is touched by Jesus, spoken to by Jesus, encounters Jesus, raised from the dead, eyes opened, whatever, whatever they, if they receive a miracle directly, the direct recipient of a miracle, every person is nameless in the gospel of Mark, except one. His name is Bartimaeus. He comes at the end of the book. He's a blind man. His eyes are opened. Here's the thing. Here's, here's why that's important. Jesus takes the time because it's personal to connect with a man who everybody else would say is nameless. Here's, here's where it connects to your life. There's somebody in the room you feel rather nameless in the grand scheme of God's story in the world. Guess what? Good news. Jesus, ma'am, Jesus, sir, knows your name. He knows your name. And because you're personal to him, he takes time to be with you, just like he would take time to be with this man. Because four friends, four friends, it got personal for four friends who sat around one day and said, we, we probably need to go get Larry. And they did. Because it, it got personal. So it, it needs to become personal for us, right? Here's what I need you to remember. If you're going to walk into the new week, just jot this down. The greatest miracle is being forgiven by Jesus. The greatest ministry is bringing a friend to Jesus. The greatest miracle is being forgiven by Jesus. Make no mistake. That's it. The greatest ministry is bringing a friend to Jesus. Notice it doesn't say bringing a friend to church. Right? I mean, that's a good thing. I mean, it's good. You're bringing friends to church. Praise God. That's great. Maybe they're going to encounter Christ. That's what we want. Amen? Okay, that's good. Sort of. But it's, it is. It is. In fact, in the 18th century, in 18th century England, there was an Anglican priest who had become so empowered by the spirit of the living God that he longed to see an awakening occur in his church. And he, he suddenly realized that, 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 that people, we need to take the message of, of, of Jesus to the people. And rather than forcing people to come into the walls of, of the church and be insiders, we need to go to the outside. And the reality is, is this man would have rather been on the inside. He would have rather been an inside guy rather than an outside guy. In fact, he didn't even want to go outside. He wanted people to come to him. His name was John Wesley. He's the founder of the Methodist movement. He didn't want to start a new denomination. He wanted to see a revival break out in his own. And so they fanned out across England and Scotland and Wales and all the area. And then eventually they came to America and it caught fire. And you're here, believe it or not. You're here as a direct result in some capacity probably because the fact that he did that. Well, the whole Wesleyan movement could be characterized as a church without walls. And maybe without a roof, or maybe a hole in the roof. So how far would you go? How far would you go to ensure that your friend, who you know and you love, 
could be known and loved by the one who already knows their name. Would you be willing to tear a hole in somebody's roof? We go, ooh, I don't know about that. I got you. I mean, I get it. That's an extreme. But the idea is still there. What would you do in an effort to connect somebody else to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let's put it this way. Would you move beyond the walls? Yes. Right? Like at the end of the service, we're going to send you out of here, and we're going to send you back into the world. So go. Here's the thing. We started this morning by simply saying that it happened so many hundreds of years ago, and that was the start of World War I. And the reality is nobody knows how we're going to go down in history, do we? And we just don't. We don't know how we're going to go down in history. We don't know how people are going to remember us. I heard somebody say one time, they said, you know, think about it this way. You're about 50 years from nobody ever remembering your name. And I was like, well, that's kind of depressing. You know? <laughs> but, you know, but, here, but here's the thing. People, people will remember us. And they'll remember our actions and maybe feel our actions more so than they will our name. In fact, what I would say to you is, it's okay to be nameless. It's okay to be like the four friends who are nameless and we don't know who they are. Names are lost to history. We'll meet them when we're, when they're in heaven. But one day, one day somebody, somebody may come to know Christ because of your efforts, which means somebody else will and someone else will and someone else will. And so they'll feel the effects of you long after they've forgotten your name. And that's okay. It's okay to be nameless in the grand scheme of things, especially if we've lived our lives spending it in knowing and helping others know the one name that's above every other name, right? The name of Jesus. So before you can go and you can leave this place and you can go into the week and you can make it personal, you can carry that message to other people. Here's what you've got to do. You've got to experience the greatest miracle yourself. You need to experience forgiveness in Jesus. And what I mean by that is simply this. Have you encountered the forgiveness of Christ? Not have you heard about it. And I, I didn't say, have you invited Jesus into your heart? I didn't say that. In fact, I'd probably say, stop inviting Jesus into your heart. Invite him into your life. Invite him into your words. Invite him into your day. Invite him into your job. Invite him into your marriage. Invite him into your family. Invite him into your finances. Invite him into your attitude. Invite him into your appetite. Listen, we're doing this Daniel fast thing. I'm inviting Jesus into my appetite every day. Because I'm like crashing and burning. I don't know about anybody else in the room. But I'm just going to be honest with you. Listen, stay with it. Stay with it. Come back around right? Come back around. Stay with it. It's all good. Bring it back to God. Just bring it back to God. Why? Because I, I just, I think it's personal. I think it's personal and I think God knows that we need to encounter his forgiveness first before we ever can carry his forgiveness to somebody else. Does that sound good? Say yes. Okay. So let's do this. Let's spend our lives, our nameless lives. It's not important if they know our name. It's more important that they know the name. And if that's what happens here at Sugar Hill United Methodist Church, if that's what happens at the church on the hill, that, that at the end of the day, 50 years from now, they'll never know our name, but there will be hundreds if not thousands of people whose lives have been impacted because of the goodness and the grace and the power and the forgiveness of Jesus. Then one day what we'll hear from God as we cross the finish line is, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm good to be nameless. I hope you are too. Who is this man? He's the forgiver. You should know him. Let's pray. Jesus, as we prepare our hearts to come to your table, we want to pause and we just simply want to say, we've tried things our way. <laughs> it hadn't worked out real well. So we're going to try things your way. God, forgive us. Forgive us for trying to take the reins. Forgive us when we grab the wheel. Forgive us, Almighty God, when we think that we're in charge. For we know the plans we have for ourselves. We declare. Instead of knowing the plans you have for us, declares the Lord. Forgive us, Almighty God, and cleanse us for our sins, for they are many. We are reminded, like the psalmist says, against you and you alone have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight, O God. You are judged right. So we ask for your forgiveness on this day. Forgive us, Almighty God. Cleanse us. 
fill our life with the power of your Holy Spirit. And God, if necessary, and you need to tear open the roof of our life so that you can do a new thing, come Holy Spirit. Find us willing to see the work of Almighty God in our life so that your work becomes personal to us and we carry it to, the, to a lost and dying world who's waiting for it to become personal for them. And we, the church of the living God, will give you thanks and praise. For it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Lord Jesus, for my friends who pray to prayer,